Hi all, a long time lurker, first time poster here. This happened about 20 years ago, when I was only 15. My parents were divorced and had by this time worked out a pretty good relationship. Their parenting styles were night and day though. My dad was a very strict military man, while my mom was an easygoing, good time Charlie. At this time, they were splitting custody of me seven days on and seven days off. My mom worked double shifts six days a week. She was only home on Sunday nights. Because of this, and the fact that my mom was so lax with rules, she allowed me to do pretty much whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. In the very few instances she would say no, I would still do what I wanted anyways because there would be pretty much zero consequences. Now, at this time, my boyfriend lived about a mile from my mom, so needless to say, I could never wait until it was my mom's week. While at her house, I would sneak over to my boyfriend's after his parents had fallen asleep. He was an only child, and his parents were pretty strict like my dad. They really didn't allow us to spend much time together outside of school. As soon as his parents would fall into bed, I would leave my house, say around 9.30 or 10 p.m., and go on a quick jog over to his. We would hang out until around 1 to 1.30 a.m., and I would leave for my early morning jog home. And during all of my jogs, I would always make sure to stay super vigilant. After all, I was a 15-year-old female jogging alone in the dark. Nobody knew where I was, and this was long before cell phones were even a thing. I'm about half a block from home, and at this point, I felt a sense of relief as soon as I saw I was in my neighborhood and able to see my mom's apartment building from here. As I continued jogging, though, I was passing the end of a driveway when this van pulls out of nowhere and stops right in front of me. I didn't even see it coming. No spidey sense, no dreadful feeling. I stopped so abruptly I almost tripped face first into the passenger side door. When I looked up, I saw two older men in the front seat, with their windows rolled down, staring me up and down. It was a slow gaze, and I could feel their eyes burning into every inch of my body. The passenger leaned out the window, getting as close to me as he could without opening his door, and asked if I wanted a ride. He smiled the most sinister smile I had ever seen. While staring into those dark eyes, everything else faded away. It was like they were the only thing that existed in that point of time. My vision zoomed in on them, and I could feel my fight or flight kick in. I quickly ran in the direction they came from. I knew the alley they had pulled out from was too narrow for their van to make the turn. They had to pull out into the street and make a U-turn to get back in. I had never run so fast in my life. I knew I didn't have enough time to make it to my mom's building before they came back so I ran to the closest one nearby and hid behind a giant trash can. My heart was beating, and I was covering my mouth to muffle my breathing and silent cries. I could hear the rocks and the loose asphalt being crushed by the tires as they slowly crept by the trash can. They stopped in front of it for what felt like an eternity and kept whispering something to each other that I couldn't make out. They didn't get out, but they kept moving forward slowly, stopping by each other building and trash can. I waited until they were out of sight and bolted the rest of the way home and locked the door. That was the last time I ever jogged to my boyfriend's house. This is the first time I'm ever posting. I decided to share my story after reading lots of chilling ones in here. This happened about five years ago. I had just turned 18 at the time and decided to go out on a trip with my best friend. We didn't plan anything in advance, just hopped in our car and went out to the mountains to explore. We passed a couple of pretty popular tourist spots in Romania, but we decided we wanted to spend our weekend somewhere more isolated. We found a pretty sweet place near a waterfall, took some pictures, and messed around. Just two teenage girls minding their own business. The weather was getting pretty bad. A thunderstorm had been announced for that evening, 
So we returned to our car and started searching for a hotel or a cabin to spend the night in. Unfortunately, most of the affordable ones were completely booked out, so we decided that if we couldn't find any place, we would just return home. Before going back, though, we decided to take an unfamiliar road, thick forest on both sides, as we wanted to snap a few more nice pictures before heading back. As we rolled through this trail, we came across a small cabin. There was an elderly couple outside, asking us if we were looking for a place to rest for the night. I couldn't find the cabin listed anywhere on the internet, and they told us they didn't usually take tourists. But it turned out they just happened to have a spare room on the first floor, with a bathroom and basically everything we needed to spend the night. We didn't want to return home, so we accepted their kind offer. They asked for an extremely cheap price as well, so we thought, why not? Sounds like a good deal. We didn't plan on getting much sleep, so the entire night we were just chit-chatting, watching soap operas on my laptop. After about 2 a.m., though, we started hearing muffled sounds from outside our door. It sounded like they were walking down that hallway, trying their best not to wake us up. Then, we heard them whispering at our door, something that we couldn't quite understand. My heart sank, and I asked my friend if she had locked it. Thankfully, she had, though. For the rest of the night, we heard them standing outside, whispering in the hallway, so of course, we couldn't fall asleep at all. As the night began to finally pass, and the rising sun shone light into our room, we noticed something outside our balcony. There was a surveillance camera hung by the ceiling in our balcony, but it was turned towards our bedroom, as if it was filming everything we were doing. We hadn't noticed it during the night, as it was pitch black outside, but as soon as the sun rose, we saw its distinguishing form. At first, we wondered what it was, but as the day continued to get brighter, we could clearly make it out. Needless to say, we packed our stuff within a couple of minutes, and drove the hell out of there without even saying goodbye. Not that we would have had the chance to. The two hosts were nowhere to be found in the entire house when we left. We were just too scared as hell chicks, and unfortunately, we didn't report this to the police. I still regret it, but I am thankful we got out of there safe, and I've learned the classic lesson to never trust strangers in the forest again. Never posted this or put it in writing before, but it's something I think about fairly often, as in a sort of what if. Of course, long time lurker, first let's not meet post. This happened a few years ago. My son had a big standardized test taking place over the weekend at a private school nearby. We had registered him and prepaid for his test. It was due to take place at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, with kids coming from all over the community. While I had driven by this school many times previously, I had never actually entered the campus before, so I wasn't exactly familiar with where we needed to go. And to lay it out a bit, the campus was exceptionally secure. It had several gated entrances, several separate parking lots, a few standalone buildings clustered around various internal courtyards, and cameras seemingly nearly everywhere. There was a six to seven foot high fence surrounding as well. Not only the full perimeter of the campus, but also around each of the individual courtyards. Some courtyards were even fully enclosed by a combination of buildings and gates, and we would come to learn that some of the gates even auto-locked behind you. This is important for later. We arrived a bit earlier than needed, with plenty of time to find the right building and testing room. Or at least I had hoped so. It was weird though, because when we first arrived, the campus was eerily quiet. I saw no cars in the main parking lot off the primary entrance, right next to the administration building. Huh. I drove around the perimeter of the school looking for an open entry point. I found an open lot off the gymnasium building in the back, quickly parked and hustled my son onto the campus. On that crisp, 
bright fall day, the empty campus was like a beautiful still life. We heard noises coming from the gymnasium building, so we made our way towards it, sure that this was where the test was going to be taking place. All we saw when we arrived, though, was a group of about 15 women gathered around long tables with holiday crafts spread about. They were preparing to decorate the school. No one seemed to know anything about the test, though. Becoming increasingly agitated and concerned he was about to miss the start time, I went into hyper-focused mode. So, I grabbed my son's hand and whipped out of the building, made a beeline for another, then another, then another once again, trying all the handles. Locked. All of them were locked. In the distance, I saw a gate to another courtyard. It must be there, I thought. Now in the course of this unintentional tour of the entire campus, which took place over about 20 minutes, aside from the volunteers gathered in the gymnasium, the only other human we encountered that morning was a lone janitor. He wore the trademark overalls, name badge on the left and school emblem on the right. He was sliding a bucket with the mop handle around the courtyard. The first time we saw him, we passed him by as we walked toward the gymnasium. He looked up. We made eye contact. Nothing more than that, though. The second time was on the way to the other courtyard. I'd flagged him down and quickly rattled off our question. Did he know where the test was taking place? He shook his head. No. I thanked him and headed towards the courtyard. Once we entered, though, I realized the gate closed behind us and we could no longer leave without entering one of the smaller buildings surrounding it. This courtyard was much smaller than the others, and enclosed by fencing, save for two little buildings, and those doors were locked too. I stood there motionless, assessing the situation, and wondering what we were going to do. In that moment, I was still consumed with finding this mysterious testing room, and I didn't really understand the situation. Namely, that my scrawny, bespectacled, ten-year-old boy and I, five foot one, were essentially trapped in this interior courtyard with this complete stranger. Who could have easily overpowered us both. He was well over six feet tall, and muscular. Finally, he spoke. Come inside and uh, check in here, he said, opening the door to an adjoining building. I'll never forget the way he looked at me and smiled holding the door to the hallway open with one hand and inviting his bent arm into the building with the other. His posture reminded me of the way doormen in fancy New York City buildings might open a door for a resident, but when I took a closer look at the man's face, it made me stop dead in my tracks. Something about this all did not seem right. I glanced inside the entryway. The open door led into a small, pitch-black hallway, and it was quite clear the building was completely deserted. And yet, because I was being unbelievably stupid, I was still considering whether I should go inside and check just to make sure. My son was to my left, and in that moment, I had actually kind of forgotten that he was standing there. It was like everything from that point happened in slow motion, and I had tunnel vision. I looked back to the man once again, he remained in the same position, as if frozen, hand on the door handle, and with the other beckoning me in. I looked back to the hallway. Do you want to check? He said again. I felt in that moment like he was intentionally trying to seem harmless. I looked at him once again. His body was even bent over a bit, as if he wanted to make his massive frame seem smaller and less threatening. In that moment, I became painfully aware that we were alone and the ladies in the gym across the campus would never be able to hear us. The place was deserted, and we were trapped. I wanted so desperately to look up and see if there were any cameras pointed at us, but I had a sinking feeling there were none, and he knew it. Suddenly, I heard my son's voice, soft, serious, and hushed. Mom, no. I jolted out of it and turned to look at him. No, he repeated. His soft blue eyes behind his glasses were so serious, his brow furrowed, and he shook his head furiously. I nodded. Thankfully, the janitor, upon seeing that we weren't going with him, turned and walked away into the building. 
It was then that I noticed that he didn't even have his mop and bucket with him. At that point, the test was the furthest thing from my mind, and I just wanted to get us out of there. I asked my son if he could climb the fence and open the gate from the other side. He nodded and sprung to it, and we got the hell out of Dodge. Note, it turned out I had gotten the test dates completely mixed up, and that was why there was no one at the school that morning. What a major fuck-up on my part. Once I understood what had happened with the test dates, it dawned on me that the janitor had to have known there was no one on campus that morning for any sort of test. There was no way he didn't know that building he tried to entice us into was in fact empty. I have no doubt my ten-year-old son saved us that day. So, to the man who tried to entice a mom and young son into a dark and empty building, let's not meet. This will be my first post. I just found this subreddit and made an account just so I could contribute my story. My sister and I are sort of magnets for weird shit happening, so I thought I might post a couple of stories on here in the future as well. This event happened when I was about 12 years old in Kansas. I was sitting there in my bedroom playing Halo. My parents were both out running errands, and my sister was at work, so I was home alone with my two dogs. A little terrier and a Bichon Frise. Not exactly the attack dog breeds, more like early warning systems at best. I had been home alone before, so it really was not a big deal. We lived in a pretty safe part of town that never really had any problems. Well, other than one time where some people sprayed KKK graffiti on some public park equipment. Anyway, I was kicking back in my chair, Doritos in one hand, controller in the other, full gamer mode, when I heard the very distinct sound of my door opening and closing like someone had just come in. The room I was in faced in such a way where I could not see the front door. My dogs got up and jolted into the living room, so I just assumed my parents must be home. I shouted out for my mom to confirm this. I'm a bit paranoid due to the aforementioned being a weird shit magnet, and I heard no response. My dogs were also not barking like they normally do when someone gets home. I thought it was kind of weird, so I paused my game and walked out into the living room. Nothing. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I had heard someone come in clear as day. I wasn't wearing headphones. I had the TV turned down and was listening to music, so I knew it couldn't have been the game. I immediately went to my parents' closet and grabbed our shotgun like a good Midwest boy tends to do. The only problem with that was I didn't know where my dad kept the shells. My plan was to fake it and hope they didn't have a gun of their own. A stupid plan, but I wasn't the brightest kid around. At this point, a doubt started to kick in. Had I actually heard the door? Was it just the game after all? But then I thought to myself, why would the dogs just jump up like that if it was? I walked back into my living room, unloaded shotgun pointing in front of me. I tried to call my dad, but he didn't pick up. I tried to call my mom, and she didn't either. I even tried to call my two best friends, but nobody would answer. My 12-year-old mind immediately jumped to, Holy fuck, they're all dead! And so for the first time in my life, I decided to call 911. The operator picked up, and I explained the situation with tears in my eyes from fear. She told me to stay calm, and that the police were on their way. The difficult part about staying calm was that there was a hallway by my front door. I knew in my heart of hearts that there was someone just waiting in that hallway, about to jump out and just fuck my day up. My two dogs came up right beside me, and were staring towards the hallway as well. This did not help the fear. I stood there rooted on the spot for what felt like an hour, but must have only been a few minutes, the operator's voice in my ear telling me to stay calm. Thankfully, just then, my parents opened the front door. What the fuck are you doing? 
I explained to my father the situation we were currently in. He grabbed his pistol from the front room. I didn't even know that that had been there. Thanks, Dad. And we go a-hunting. I always thought it would be cool to go around clearing rooms and shit like a SWAT team. But fuck if I wasn't about to shit myself every time we opened a bedroom door. We couldn't find anything. The police arrived shortly after and told us that this had been happening in the neighborhood over the past few weeks. People would wait until the homeowners left, check the door, and if it was unlocked, they would go in and steal everything. They said whoever it was probably left when they heard that someone was home, which never quite sat right with me, because I only ever heard the door open and close once. Ever since this happened, I triple check every door and window lock whenever I'm home alone. To whoever walked into my house that day, I never saw you, and I hope I never do. As a fun little postscript to this story, I told it to one of my friends, and he offhandedly said, You only heard the door open once. You probably heard them leaving then, not entering. They must have already been in the house. That was not comforting. helpful and pertinent background information before we begin. This happened over seven years ago, spring of 2013, in Barcelona, Spain. For reference, Barcelona is a large city made up of many districts. This took place in the Example District, where I lived at the time. This is my best attempt to describe the makeup of this district. Like most big cities, there are blocks. Block after block, the area begins to develop into this grid-like pattern. However, this district is unique, because each block is instead shaped like an octagon. So when you're picturing this area of the city, think of this as an entire chunk of octagons. I was told that the pattern, rather than true squares, makes it easier for drivers to see the perpendicular street traffic when approaching an intersection. Uh, lastly, some folks use the edge or corners of this octagon grid pattern to park their vehicle when quickly running into a cafe or pharmacy. At the time of this incident, I was a 20-year-old blonde white female studying abroad from the United States in Barcelona, Spain. The Spanish was my minor in college, so I was fairly confident in my abilities to navigate the city and interact with the locals. Ashley was also a 20-year-old blonde white female, studying abroad from the United States as well. On to the story. It's a Friday or Saturday night in March. A large group of us, both women and men, decide to go out and have a good time. We always find ourselves at big bustling nightclubs, dancing the night away. The night itself is unremarkable. Although I can't remember exactly what time we all decide to head back to our residencia, I know it was very late, into the early hours of the morning. The men's cab came first, and they each piled in to head home. As us girls were waiting for our multiple cabs, a girl from our group, Ashley, decides that she's too impatient to wait any longer and wanted to walk home by herself. Don't forget this is after a night out drinking and dancing, and definitely a drunken Ashley decision. We all tried to convince her to wait for the cabs and ride home with us. However, she just seemed hell-bent on walking home. And because it was cold and late, all the other girls in the group decided to let Ashley go on and continued to wait for their cabs. I, on the other hand, couldn't let her walk home by herself in good conscience. We were in a foreign city, and it was far past 2 a.m. in the morning. It was chilly, and in March, we were wearing scanty clothing with big heels, drunk, and this is before iPhones had affordable long-term international plans, aka we didn't have them. I called out to Ashley, who had already begun to make her trek home to wait up. It's important to note that this is no brisk walk up the street. Our residencia is 2.4 kilometers, approximately 1.5 miles from our starting point. I catch up with her and begin the trek home together. A few blocks away from the nightclub, the city is relatively quiet. We're just huddling together on our walk to stay warm, laughing and joking about the night's events. 
Well, we notice a dark green sedan pulling into a parking spot, located on one of the corners of the block directly in front of us. As this was happening, Ashley and I decided to cross the street to avoid walking past the vehicle. It was still running and had left its headlights on. As we're crossing the street, a slender man, probably around 5 foot 7 ish, stepped halfway out of the driver's side door of the vehicle and called out, What is the time? in Spanish. I thought this was odd, as surely his vehicle, which was still on, had a clock. Uh, late, I said. I believe the man followed up with an additional question or statement, but I can't remember the nature. I do know that we didn't respond, though. We didn't think too much of this encounter and decided to just continue home. After progressing a couple of more blocks, we saw the same dark green sedan slowly passing right in front of us. After a long night of drinking, though, we questioned whether it was really the same car from just a couple of minutes ago. We ended up convincing ourselves that we were being paranoid drunks and continued the walk home, albeit at a substantially quicker pace. As we were just beginning to laugh at how ridiculous we were, the sedan passes in front of us yet again, this time going in the other direction. It was as if he was continuously crossing our paths, horizontally by turning left or right after each block. After two or three times, we both knew we were not being paranoid and that this car was taking active measures to follow us. Ashley and I quickly sobered up and began speed walking as fast as possible, repetitively crossing the street in an effort to lose the man in the dark green sedan. Understand that we believed we could not change course as we only knew this one particular way home and didn't have access to map via cell phones. We were presumably only halfway to our residencia at this point. As Ashley and I are quietly discussing what our next move will be, we see that the dark green sedan is again parked in a spot along the corners of the next block. This time, though, he turned his headlights off. As soon as we spot the vehicle, Ashley and I quickly take cover behind a larger one that was parked on the side of the street. Terrified, we're still as statues. Neither one of us utters a word. I cannot tell you how long we hunched behind this truck, but it felt like forever. After looking underneath, we see that the dark green sedan is gone. We both sighed in relief, thinking we might have lost him. We crossed to the other side and continued towards our home. And despite our wishes, Ashley and I's encounter with the man was far from over. We were alert as ever, trying to mentally figure out how much further until we reached our destination. Continuously looking back over our shoulder, we see that the man from the sedan is following us. This time, however, he's on foot, walking directly two or three blocks behind us. We screamed and took off running as fast as we can. Like we have throughout our walk home, we cross the street to place more distance between ourselves and the man. As we're running for our lives, we remove our heels so we can run even faster. It's on this evening that I learned that heels serve a dual purpose as weapons. We held our shoes in front of our hands, facing heel out, just in case we would need to defend ourselves. A glance behind us. The man is gone. I glance across the street. He's gone there, too. We continue running, gasping for air, Ashley and I running stride and stride with one another. Neither of us could figure out where the man had gone. We were confused. Where did he go? What does he want? Why is he following us? Though we didn't stop sprinting home, we slowed down just a bit to catch our breath. With each leap, Ashley and I were looking in every direction surrounding us. She then turns to me and sternly says, Across the street! Look! Across the street! And look. And there he is. I see that he's been running alongside us the whole time. He's neck and neck with our every leap. There's only the street and a line of parked vehicles on either side, separating us from this crazy man. Each time I look over, he's ducking in and out of parked vehicles hiding on the side of the street, attempting to avoid our detection. At this point, Ashley and I are on the verge of tears. We were running like never before, and this madman was following us for what felt like a lifetime. Just when it felt like there was no end in sight, I began to notice our surroundings. We were close by now, and only residents can access it with a magnetic keycard. 
I fumble as I run barefoot on the Barcelona streets for my entrance key. I found it in the nick of time. As I place the key on the card reader, she's yelling at me. He's coming! Hurry! The door shoots open. Once in our building, we pulled the door shut so the automatic lock would activate. When I heard the door lock into place, my legs suddenly felt like jello, and I could barely make it up the few steps to the lobby. Crying, Ashley and I told the man stationed at the front desk, who we appropriately named Baldi, to call Spain's equivalent to 911. He looked at us with a blank stare. We explained to him what had just happened, and that the man from the dark green sedan is right around the corner. He laughed and told us to stop telling him our drunk stories and just go to our rooms. It's been over seven years since this happened, and I still think of it far too often. Though Ashley and I are back in the United States, we now live hundreds of miles apart. When we do catch up, we always briefly acknowledge our close encounter and thank God we made it out the way we did. I have no idea what the man's intentions were, but there's no doubt in my mind they couldn't have been good. Okay, so this happened to my friend Chris and I back in the summer of 2013. We were both 15 at the time, and we were headed to our favorite smoking spot in town, nicknamed the Snake Path. No snakes there, so I have no idea why it was called that. It was the site of a torn down factory, and is now just overgrown woods, and only the cement foundation is left. The best place to hang out was where the loading docks were, since there was a nice ledge to sit on. Once we had gotten there and had the blunt all rolled up, we began smoking and just hanging out as usual. As soon as we started burning, I got a phone call from my grandma, so of course I answered and was pacing around our spot talking to her. After about ten minutes of talking, I'm standing on a rock pile facing away from Chris, who was roughly ten feet behind me. I finally hung up the phone and turned around so I could pass the blunt back to him. As I turned around though, I saw someone standing behind Chris. It was an older man wearing a hat and a huge bandage or something covering most of his face. He was holding a bloody knife in one hand and a phone in the other. My stomach turned and I was at a loss for words. I was trying to speak but I couldn't do anything other than weakly point towards him. Thankfully, the look of fear on my face alone was enough to get Chris to turn around. Luckily, Chris wasn't scared as easily as I was, and was actually a very buffed-out dude. I was very skinny, and got spooked very easily. Dude, what the fuck are you doing? Chris was backing towards me while clenching his fists. The man had a crazed look in his eyes, and he responded. I know you killed the cats. I know you fuckers did it. Now we're both visibly confused. Neither of us would ever consider hurting an animal. What are you talking about, man? What cats? We were just here smoking. I haven't seen any cats, dead or alive. Yes, you did. You fucking killed my cats. I'm recording you, and I'm going to do to you what you did to them. He started to creep closer in our direction. Now we were both freaking out, because we didn't have any form of protection from this psychopath in the woods. We started to back up, telling him over and over again we didn't even see any cats. We were just here to get high and have fun. Please, put the knife down and stop recording us. As you can guess, he didn't listen to us at all. We would have just run. However, our backpacks and things were behind him at this point. We were practically begging him to just leave us alone and go away. All of a sudden, though, he stood up, turned around, and just walked away towards the street. We thought we were in the clear to get our bags and try to find a way out of there whilst avoiding him. We hopped onto the main pathway that we had entered through, and as we moved on, we started to see dead cats popping up that were 100% not there when we had walked into the woods originally. After seeing that, we began to run as fast as we could out of the woods. Right as we were just about to get back onto the street, however, right before getting to the main road, the old man lunged out of some bushes towards Chris. 
Chris jumped back and kicked the man in the ribs a few times. We ran as fast as we could out and down the street until we were out of breath and ready to pass out. We never really talked about the event afterwards, and we never saw the man again, thankfully. We only returned a few more times after, but only with large groups of people, and nothing like that ever happened again. The snake path is now gone, and in its place, the city has built a very large apartment complex on the site. So for a preface, I was 19, I'm now 22, and I worked in the mall in my town. My town is relatively calm, never really any major crimes committed, but the city that's about 15 minutes out used to have the highest murder rate in all of Canada. The mall I worked at was pretty small. The usual types of customers were moms with their kids or older people just trying to pass the time away. Not a sketchy type of mall at all, and very safe to work at. One day, I was on my break, and I went to the food court to get a drink and sit down, just browse my phone as usual. I noticed two women walking towards me. My first instinct was that they saw my uniform, and that they were going to ask me something about a product that my store sold. I didn't really think anything sinister of it. They come up to me and sit down right away. They both had very heavy accents, though I'm not sure what kind, because it hadn't been something I'd ever heard before. They were both dressed very classy as well, as if they were about to go out on an outing to church. They seemed relatively normal. One woman pulls out a book, and they began to ask me some odd questions, such as, Do you go to church? Do you believe in God? Mainly just things that had to do with religion. And this led me to assume that they must be some sort of missionaries. Then they began to tell me about God the Mother. With me being extremely shy, I just sat there and listened to them talk. They asked me if I was able to come with them to a youth group they had organized that was going to go on tonight. I told them that I was at work and just on break so I couldn't go, but they continued to insist. And finally though, after a while of prodding, they got the message that I just couldn't go with them, so they asked me for my phone number and told me that they'd text me next time they arrange one and I could go then. I really didn't want to talk to them anymore. I wanted to get them to leave, so I agreed and gave them my phone number. A couple of days later, I got a text from them trying to arrange something, but I just blocked the number right away and thought nothing of it. It's not that I thought they were planning on doing anything to me, I just really wasn't into going to a youth group at all. But only a couple of months later, I was reading through the news. There was a story warning young girls about a human trafficking scheme in my city. It was said that woman would come up to you and talk to you about God the Mother and try to get you to leave with them. Thank goodness I hadn't finished my shift yet, and thank goodness I never responded to their text. It's so weird to me to think that if I would have gone... I probably wouldn't even be in Canada right now. This happened to me when I was 19, which would have been around 2003. I was born and raised in a small town, and I was pretty sheltered throughout my childhood and teenage years. I was always warned about stranger danger, but had never really been in a bad situation before. That is, until this happened. After high school, my best friend Jennifer moved to Los Angeles to attend USC. I would say that at this point in my life, I had never been to a truly large city before, so when I went to visit her, it was a bit of culture shock for me, especially things like the subway, bus, and train systems. Everyone seemed to know exactly where they were going with no help from anyone, and it was pretty overwhelming to me. Luckily, I made it okay to our dorm from the airport. I stayed for a week or so, and we had a pretty great visit. Jennifer and I were always together, which made navigating public transit fairly easy and comfortable. And the day I was to head back to the airport, though, she had to work. I didn't want her to worry, 
and I felt fairly comfortable after riding the bus and subway throughout the week. I said my goodbyes and managed to get on the train to the airport. The first stretch of my trip went fine. I think I had even printed off directions. In case you've never used the LA train system, it travels through a lot of smaller neighborhoods before it hits more recognizable, typical, this way to the airport signs. At this point, I had become convinced because of this that I was going the wrong way. I had no idea where I was and that I was going to miss my plane. Basically, I was completely panicking. I got off at the next stop, found the map of transit lines, studying them like they were written in Greek, and that's when he came up to me. When I try to think now about what he looked like, it's just a big blur. He was a very big man, and that's what I remember. He had a hundred pounds on me easy, but he was a security guard. He was very friendly and approached me asking if I needed help. He seemed to genuinely want to help me, so when he asked me if I wanted a ride to the airport, which was very close by, he told me. I accepted, grateful to get where I was going. For me at the time, security guard was as good as a cop. I know now that's not the case, but I implicitly trusted him because of the badge and uniform. The first odd feeling I had was the way he threw my suitcase into his trunk, just tossing it in and slamming. Then I got into his car. It was filthy, with cigarette butts and trash strewn throughout. I remember not knowing where to put my feet, and had to put them on top of piles of garbage. Still, he had a picture of a little kid dangling from his rearview mirror, and so I thought, okay, it's not a big deal. He's a good person. We start driving, and I have absolutely no idea where he is going. But of course, how could I? However, after a while, it was clear that he was not going to the airport, or at least not the direct route. I try to stay calm and ask him questions. He asserts that he knows where he's going. This is the fastest, secret way. Things like that. Well, we ended up in a pretty abandoned business area, a place for freight and other businesses that were either closed or empty. There wasn't a single soul in sight, just deserted stretches of road. He began to circle the same streets, retracing where he'd already been. At this point, I was freaking out, but I didn't want him to know how scared I was. It's here that I felt like I wake up to the bad position I'm in. He had these reflective sunglasses on and was smoking cigarette after cigarette. After a while of me trying to ask where we were and where we were going, he stopped talking altogether refusing to answer me. After a long period of driving in silence, he started to ask me about my underwear, how long I had been wearing it, what color it was. At first, I played along, trying to be cool, I guess. I made up the color they were, saying my boyfriend wouldn't like the conversation, and stuff like that. I tried to placate him, not wanting to make him angry. Then he told me he would give me $100 just to see it, and began to reach over and grope me, my knee and thigh. I just told him no, not interested, but he didn't stop trying. At this point, I was fully aware of the danger I was in. The only thing I wanted was to be able to get out of the car. I began to think about how bad it would hurt with how fast we were going. I began to tell him that if he wanted to just drop me off, I could have someone come get me. I remember trying to make him think that none of this was a big deal, that he could just leave me and that I would be fine. I just wanted to get out of the car. I kept trying to remind him that I had a plane to catch, that I was worried I wouldn't make it. And though I imagined that I sounded calm, I know that in my fear, I was shakily saying everything. It's hard to remember how long we drove into what feels like the middle of nowhere. I was leaning far into my side of the passenger seat, thinking I would just have to jump out. And then, after a final refusal of his advances, he speeds up and leaves the area we were driving around in. He drives me to the closest train station and quickly pulls into the lot. Needless to say, I've never been so happy to see his train station. I quickly got out of his car and made sure people can see me. I can remember thinking that was the most important part. He got out, pulled my luggage out of his trunk and threw it all over the ground, called me a bitch and sped off. I did get to the airport and make my flight. I didn't tell anyone this story for a long time because I felt so stupid that I had put myself into this now obviously dangerous situation. I still feel this way, 
but now I worry that I should have told someone that maybe he did this to someone else who didn't get so lucky. I currently go to a large university in Philadelphia, and my school isn't exactly in the greatest part of the city. I'm a senior now, and I've sort of learned to just keep my head down, and most of the people in the area will leave me alone. The one exception that I've had to this was my freshman year. My roommate freshman year was an absolute madwoman, stealing my stuff, threatening to physically assault me, and even spreading awful rumors about me. I generally tried to stay out of my room for the most part, just to avoid any interaction with her, at least until I was able to get a new roommate the next semester. As a result, I spent a lot of my free time at the library or at other friends' places. A few weeks into my first semester, I think it was around early October, I was hanging out at a friend's place. He lived over on the other side of campus, Probably a 15 minute walk or so from my dorm room, but my path from my room to his dorm never left campus. I had been warned prior to moving into my dorm room that campus was the safest place for students because the locals generally stayed off campus unless they were grabbing food from a food truck or something. And keeping that in mind, I didn't really mind walking back from my friend's dorm room late at night since the path was well lit and the only people I would ever see were other students. Regardless, it was getting quite late. It was a week night as well, so I told my friend that I was going to head out. He offered to walk me home, but I declined, saying I would be fine, which was my first mistake. The walk back was perfectly fine, actually, at least until I got up to the block that my dorm building was on. For context, there was another empty dorm building on the block that I lived on. It was scheduled to be torn down later that year because there was black mold everywhere inside, but at the time it was still standing and there were absolutely no lights outside of it. There was a courtyard behind the building, which I often used as a shortcut. This was my second mistake. As I entered the dark courtyard, I used my phone as a flashlight to guide my way through the space. As I was nearing the other end of it, I suddenly heard someone call out, Hey, miss! Obviously, my first thought was, no way. I just kept walking, pretending I hadn't heard anything, and picked up my pace. But the voice called out again, Hey, miss, wait! At this point, I was nearly out of the courtyard, and there was finally some light coming from the windows of my dorm building. I could kind of see what was going on now without completely relying on my flashlight. I turned around to see who had been calling me, which was my third mistake, and was met with a man standing in the dark. He looked so ordinary, except for his oddly wide smile, and the fact that he was carrying a rather heavy looking trash bag. Hey miss, I have something for you. I, I think I'm okay, I need to be heading home. No, I think you'll like this. Just, uh, let me show you. He opened the trash bag and reached his hand in. I didn't know what to expect, so I ran. I ran further from the courtyard and towards the ramp that led up to my building, thinking I could outrun him, but I was sorely mistaken. Despite the fact that there was about 10 to 15 feet between us, as soon as I turned, his hand was around my wrist. Miss, I have something for you. I really think you'll need it. Feeling trapped and unsure what to do, I sighed, defeated. I hoped to God that someone would look out their window and see what was going on, or someone else would be walking back to the building at a late hour and see us. I wanted to scream, but I was scared that if I drew attention to us, that he would do something that would make me really regret trying to get help. Again, it was not the greatest part of the city. He smiled at me like he knew I wasn't going to try and call out and let go of my wrist. I didn't realize how tightly he had been grabbing me until he finally released it. He took a step back from me and reached into his trash bag again. My heart was pounding and I wasn't sure what to expect, but it definitely wasn't what he pulled out of the bag in the end. It was a clock 
an old digital alarm clock. The thing had to be at least 20 years old, and it was completely encrusted with dirt, like he had just pulled it out of a junkyard. I was stunned at the sight of the yellow and orange plastic. After I realized he was actually trying to give me the clock, I thought it might have been a bomb. Here, this is just for you. Oh, I really don't need one. I have a clock up in my room already. I gestured toward the massive building behind me. Well, you need this one. This one's different. What the fuck? What's that supposed to mean? Ah, uh, miss, see this one has a radio. I'm pretty unique, don't you think? I bet yours doesn't have a radio function. I mean, mine didn't, but don't most alarm clocks have radios built into them? I took a step back from him, but as I stepped back, he stepped closer, mirroring my movement. He reached out, pressing the clock towards me. I took another step back. He took one more forward. I knew my back was literally going to be against the wall of the dorm building if I took only another two steps back. I wasn't sure where to go. I felt like I had no choice but to go against everything my body was telling me not to do and accept the clock. I reached out and noticed that where he had grabbed my arm before, it was already forming a bruise. With my hand now outstretched, he placed the clock in my hand. I felt so dirty having it there. I don't know how to describe it, but it instantly felt like I had just finished rolling around in the dirt. My arm felt like it was throbbing because this clock was just so heavy. It felt like it was getting heavier with every passing second. I knew it just felt like that because I was freaking out, but it didn't make the experience any less terrifying. I didn't know what to do. The man was still standing there smiling at me. I blurted out, thanks, and spun around gripping the clock. I, t I took a step away from him towards the ramp leading up to my building, and he took a step back. I decided that this was my chance to bolt for the door. I spun around on my heels and took another few steps before hearing him call out, You're so beautiful. I love you. I turned back, but when I did, the man was already out of sight. I screamed. I didn't know what I had just gotten myself into, but I didn't want any part of it. I sprinted towards the door of the building, dumping the clock and the trash can outside on the way. I thought there was still a decent chance that it was a bomb, and if it was going to explode, I wanted it to do so in a contained space. Nothing came of the man, or the clock, other than a bruise on my arm. It healed completely within just a few days, and soon after that I had forgotten about the incident. I think I just repressed the memories, and didn't want to unpack what I had gone through. I still try not to think about it, and the only reason I'm running this now is because one of my current not crazy roommates had brought it up a few days ago, and the floodgates of my brain opened. I felt like I needed to share what happened. When I was in college, at 20 years old, I was lucky enough to spend a semester abroad in Cork, Ireland. I lived in a run-down apartment complex on the bank of the River Lee in an apartment with five other female students. It was a great location near the school and near downtown, and while the apartment was not luxurious, I didn't spend a lot of time there between classes and friends' places and weekends traveling the country. Our apartment was on the first floor, and the building had a front and side entrance. I sometimes used the side entrance when coming back from school, but that meant I often ran into the guy who lived right next to the side door. I met him my first week there, actually, where he said hello to me as I was walking out. I said hi back, which seemed friendly enough. I was young, and Ireland is full of friendly people. This guy was in his mid-thirties, and not Irish. I don't know where he was from, but it seemed like English might have been his second language. He introduced himself and reached out to shake hands. I did the same and shook his hand back, and that's when he wouldn't let go. His grip was firm and tight, and he leaned in, pulling my arm closer, as he asked for my phone number. I lied and said I had just arrived. I didn't have a phone yet. He said that was okay and asked if I had a boyfriend. 
I didn't, but uncomfortable with the situation, I lied and said that I did. Back home? He asked. Yeah, I said. Well, you're here now, and he's there. I can be your boyfriend here. I'm fully freaked out now. I managed to get my hand back and excuse myself with something about having to urgently get to class. I started to avoid using that entrance after that, and talking with my roommates. I soon learned I wasn't the only one with an experience with the creepy guy down the hall. Often, we'd leave the apartment in pairs or groups, and always avoided that side entrance. Luckily, it was easy enough to slip in and out the front door, though. I was lucky enough to have a single bedroom in the apartment, with a window that faced out towards the street. Although it was street level, there was a tall, spiked iron fence and a small depression of rocks and stones that kept anyone from getting close to the building. I felt safe enough keeping my window open when I was at home or sleeping, and I tried to remember to close it whenever I left. And one day, about a month into the semester, I noticed handprints on the thin layer of city soot that accumulated on my window. Looking at them, I realized they were from someone who was on the outside, pressing their palms into the glass, as if trying to get a better look inside. Whoever it was would have had to reach out their arms through the fence to touch the glass. I freaked out a little, but then I thought about the group of students on the second floor who we often hung out with. They were good people and would call us sometimes from the street to get our attention if they were going out. I figured it was one of them, trying to see if we were home and brushed it off. I wish I hadn't. Maybe about a week later, I was sitting on my bed near the window, reading a book, when I heard a tapping on the glass, and startled, I looked up. It was the creepy guy, waving at me from the street. Come outside, he said. No. He yelled again, and with my heart pounding, I pulled the window shut and closed the curtains. He kept tapping on the window for a minute, and I could hear him cajoling me to join him outside. I sat there, heart pounding until he gave up and left. I realized in this moment that he knew not only which apartment was mine, but also my room. I kept my curtains closed from then on. As I got busier and spent nights sleeping on friends' floors and weekends on short trips to England and Scotland, I didn't think of the man much anymore, and I didn't run into him for quite a long time. Hoping he'd gotten the hint, I was glad to miss him. Until one night. I got home late. Very late. So late, in fact, that it was actually early. Maybe around 3 or 4 a.m. My friends had walked me home and seen me get safely in the front door of the apartment complex. More than a little drunk and exhausted, I came into my room, took off all my clothes, and collapsed into the bed. As I lay there, hoping sweet sleep would soon keep the room from spinning, I heard the apartment door suddenly open. This in and of itself wasn't unusual. I lived with five other people after all. They came in and went all the time. But it was very late for anyone to be just getting home. Then, I remembered that four of them were gone for the weekend, and the fifth was away staying with her boyfriend. My eyes shot open, and I felt my adrenaline push the liqueur from my blood. Someone was in my apartment. The hallway light was on, and all I could see was the silhouette of a man. He stood in the door and stared at me. I clutched the duvet around myself and realized I was trapped, naked and alone in the apartment. The window was too small to get through, and the man was much bigger than me. In my still drunk state, I decided if I was alone, I was going to be as loud as I could. Maybe someone might hear me. I sat up and shouted, No! I saw him flinch, and then step back. He said something I couldn't understand, and I shouted over him once more. No, this is my room! He tried to talk once more, but I shouted louder. This is my room. Get out! He stumbled back into the hall a bit so I could see him better. It was the creepy man. I screamed this time, shrill and loud, and he grabbed the door handle and shut the door to my room. I was sitting up in the bed my heart pounding, alone again in the dark. I heard him walk down the hallway outside my door, then back up, and then I heard the apartment door open and close. In a moment, I was up and throwing on a sweatshirt. 
I whipped open my bedroom door, turning all the lights on and checking every corner. No one was there. He was gone. I checked the apartment door, which I found, alarmingly, was unlocked. I snapped the deadbolt and put on the chain, realizing my drunk self must have forgotten to lock the front door when I'd come in. Somehow, the creepy guy had been watching me the whole time and took that as an invitation. I spent the rest of the night in my bed, waiting for daylight and for one of my roommates to get back. I told my roommates when they returned, to their horror, and we all double-checked all the locks from then on. The semester ended soon after, and a few friends and I left Ireland to spend a few weeks traveling Europe before going home. I never saw the creepy man again after that. I hope he finally got the hint, but creepy guy who lived in my Irish apartment building. Let's never meet again. I'm new to Reddit, but I'm pretty sure that my story fits in best on this page. Sorry if I've made any mistakes, as I've never shared this before. So this event happened to me and my friends 20 years ago now, and I'm now 38. Female, by the way. I live in Tennessee, and we have a place here that's called Little Egypt. I live in Tennessee, and we have a place here that's called Little Egypt. It's a swimming hole. My friends and I had been there almost a million times at night. It was the middle of summer and the county fair was in town. My twin sister and I and two of our friends had went and hung out like teenagers do. We ran into our mom, stepdad, and little sister while we were at the fair and told our mom we were heading down to Little Egypt to goof off, as we had done a lot that summer. I remember she specifically told me and my twin sister not to go down there that late because anything could happen. We were 18 at the time though, and of course you didn't listen to your parents much at that age. We told her she was being crazy. Nothing would ever happen to us. Well, we waited till around midnight and decided to go down to the swimming hole. It was me and my friend Lisa in one car, and my twin sister and our friend Heather in the other. When you get to the swimming hole, it's out there in the woods, probably about 10 minutes from the closest civilization. Nowhere to turn around either, unless you go all the way on up down the road. We pull in and get out of our cars. We were still standing pretty close by because we hadn't gotten our flashlights and things yet. I started to walk towards the car my twin sister was standing at, when all of a sudden, we could hear some sticks breaking from the forest. I looked at my sister, and I whispered to her, Did you hear that? She whispered back yes. Maybe it was Lisa messing with us. We told Lisa to stop trying to scare us. It isn't funny. Hey, I didn't do anything. All of a sudden, we could hear tons of sticks breaking. My sister and Heather jumped back in their car. I ran to Lisa's. We barely had a chance to jump in in time. She has automatic seat belts, and it nearly broke my shoulder getting in so fast. I don't know how we got the cars turned around in that little space we had, but somehow we managed it. As we did, though, we noticed there were six men dressed in black from head to toe. They all had masks on and jumped out of the woods right where we were parked at. They all had baseball bats and started chasing after our cars. About three days later, we went back down there, only to see that there was police crime tape everywhere and other people were wandering around. We tried to ask what had happened. They told us that some man had gotten beaten to death three nights ago, the same night the six men had jumped out on us. Thank God we got away that night, but my heart breaks for the man that lost his life. I just discovered this sub, and I've been reading your stories. Some are quite frightening indeed. I have a tale from a long time ago I thought I would share, and I really think it belongs here. I hope it doesn't bore you. Right now, I'm a 72-year-old man. This happened a long age ago, but I remember it so well. The background was a series of events that placed me in a mountain cabin outside of Frederick, Maryland, 
circa 1969 or 1970. Let's just say my life at the time was in disarray. I had dropped out of college. My father had died a very bad death, and I was all alienated. I needed to get my mind right. The opportunity to move to an isolated cabin, to live in contemplation and solitude, was welcome. I had some inheritance money to pay for it. To the best of my memory, I was there about eight to nine months. No TV, but books and radio. I had a library card as well, but I can't remember if I had a phone. The story begins when a month into my stay, a female beagle showed up to my door one day. She was a lost dog, and I took her in. Never could train her to do anything, but I fed her, and she was sweet, if not the brightest of dogs. A few months in, I began to feel a presence around the isolated cabin. It's hard to describe, but I always felt like someone was watching. On many occasions, I even thought someone might be looking into my cabin window, watching us. The next phase was the shadowing, or following. I knew the folks a half mile down the lane, woods all around, and would sometimes visit them at night. Someone, something was waiting for me, and always followed closely in the woods beside me in the darkness. I could hear it easily, the footsteps in the woods, and it picked up its pace as I did. This not only happened to me, but to my younger brother who would visit, and also to friends, and it spooked them, big time. At night, it was out there around the cabin. Here's the funny thing, though. I was never afraid. I never felt threatened. Not at all, at least early on. There was no feeling of malevolence. I spent a good bit of time wandering the vast areas of woodlands around me, there was a state park just up the hill, and the Frederick Municipal Forest went on for mile after mile. The whole of western Maryland was much more country than it is now. None of that home development had set in yet. In our hikes, the dog and I, we came across evidence of campsites, recent ones, in the woods. Traces of fires, old abandoned buildings that had corners that gave shelter and looked slept in. Garbage, food and drink, paper, what have you. Perhaps just hunters, but much of it did not have the organized feel you would get from experienced hunters. The last month of my stay there is when things started to intensify. Maybe he sensed that I was preparing to leave. In the mornings, I would find small dead animals at the bottom of the front porch steps. The cabin had a small front porch screened with a light door and four wooden steps to the ground. A spotlight would illuminate the long front yard, with the woods by either side. The dead animals began to appear on many mornings. I remember it started as small birds, then a squirrel, a rabbit, even a weasel one day, like they were offerings. I had to grab them up before the dog ate them. This went on almost daily for several weeks. One night, very late, I was awoken by some sound. I lay in bed and heard something coming from the porch. I hopped up and hit the lights. I saw that hound dog, who never learned to sit or stay, standing by the door in a perfect point position. She was shivering in fear. She never barked. I heard the door slam and steady footsteps going down the porch. I turned on the spotlight but I couldn't see anything. I went out. He had been on the porch at my front door, perhaps trying to enter. After that, I stayed in at night more and more. The animal offerings got bigger and bigger. Larger birds, a possum, a woodchuck. It was not funny anymore. The final two gifts were legs from either horses or cows, big and bloody. One was even skinned. Holy shit! The second to last day, the dog left me. I could hear her in the woods howling on a trail, following a scent. I looked for her in every way I could, came up in the following weeks, but to no avail. She left just as she had come. I moved back to the Maryland suburbs of DC, got an apartment with a friend, got a job, and moved on with my life. One day not long after, though, 
I picked up the Washington Post, and there was an article about recent encounters with the Skysville monster. It described a tall, yeti-like creature, fur-covered, on two legs that would pick out a family or person and give them attention. Now, I wasn't the only one. That attention described in the article was exactly what had happened to me. Following you at night, looking inside your house, gifts and so on. I was shocked. If I had turned on that spotlight and seen Bigfoot or a Yeti, I might still be running even to this day. But I think I know who it was. The Sykesville, Maryland was the location of the Springfield Hospital Center, a large state psychiatric hospital. It was 20 miles or so east of Frederick. Back then, many folks knew how to live in the woods. They just grew up that way. Country folks. I think the monster was an escaped patient, or perhaps a free schizophrenic who lived outside. This is like all the homeless you see in cities now. Probably off his meds, but somehow functional and lonely. He would pick people or families to adopt. I imagine the camps in the woods would have been him. Nothing to do. He would make mischief. I think he liked me, but sensed I was leaving. I can't prove any of this. It's just my theory. My monster was very much of that time and place, and his behavior was what I noticed in nearly every case then. I don't think he could have survived until the 1980s. Deinstitutionalization of mental hospitals threw the mentally ill out into the streets and took away the shelter of hospitals. Unprotected, the mentally ill die.